David Ogilvy and the changing of the guard. Standing high on a hill overlooking a tributary of the Loire and close to the city of Poitiers lies a 30-room French chateau named Tufu. In the summer of 73, David Ogilvy was finally able to call it home. His paradise and base to indulge both his ego and passions, fine food and even finer wine. Rumours spread like wildfire as soon as he moved in. Some say he could walk on water. A visitor once asked if the swimming pool was where he practised. He responded, I don't need to practise. Then there's the dungeon. Apparently he mused about imprisoning art directors who set type in reverse. You know, black background, white font. He hated that. This one is unconfirmed. I heard he would just summon them to Tufu for lectures that lasted hours. The subject, usually the importance of not caring about awards. Everyone knew someone with a story. It wasn't surprising why he was a maverick. Ogilvy and Mather started out of New York in 1948 with zero clients and two staff and over time was built into one of the largest advertising agencies in the world. Though he didn't start that agency until he was 38. He was preoccupied, you see. After being thrown out of Oxford for laziness, having not passed any exams, he moved to Paris to become a chef at the Hotel Majestic on Avenue Kleber. It was hard work. 63 hours a week, standing up straight under the tutelage of a terrifying man named Monsieur Pitard. He then moved to Scotland where Ogilvy honed his craft selling Argo cookers door to door. He was so good that at just 24 they asked him to write the sales manual. After that for British intelligence during the war, even becoming a tobacco farmer, which he was lousy at. Though he did get an insight into the Amish. Not long after age 38 came the advertising agency Ogilvy and Mather. This great success would ultimately cause him great pain many years later. There was a tension thickening in the air, despite the serene hills, lush forests and gentle mountains surrounding Tufu. Tufu? What? Dressed in a smart navy pinstripe suit, Martin Sorrell was the man gunning for his throne. This was business as usual for Sorrell. In just a few short years, he had fast turned a small maker of wire baskets, wire and plastic products, into a vast marketing media and communications conglomerate. We know it today as WPP. Representative of a turning point, this was both a generational and personal clash between an advertising titan in Ogilvy and the new face of the advertising world in Sorrel. Sorrel was global, consolidated and financially driven, everything Ogilvy was not. Many were laying their eyes on him for the first time. That odious little jerk. I started this agency without a nickel and then this, this bookkeeper comes along and tries to buy the thing. They all wondered whether the rumours they heard were actually true. He doesn't look as though he could walk on water. Having been retired since 1975 and with far fewer shares than he would have liked, the odds weren't on his side. Before them was the poster boy for the creative revolution. He swung for the fences on every campaign. He put up some fight, mostly cursing at whoever would listen. But, ladies and gentlemen, there was little he could do. Eventually, it was agreed that Ogilvy and Mather would be purchased for $864 million. The highest price ever paid for an ad agency at the time. 
Even after the sale, he held that Sorrel was an odious little jerk.